Good morning. We're here for our last lesson in Daniel. As you can see, the sun is uh, not out yet. It's a rather cool morning. It's going to be a great, uh, going to be a great day. I'd like to uh, express for Mary and I our uh, appreciation for all the prayers and cards that we've received um, after Kim's passing. Uh, we certainly uh, thank you for all of that. Uh, next Sunday, a uh, joyous event should be, as scheduled, uh, our first meeting in class. I hope all of you can uh, be there for that. We'll have our first lesson in the book of Revelation. So before we get started, let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Our Father God, we uh, thank you for your world. We thank you for your creation. We thank you for your plan and your salvation in your Son, Jesus Christ. Be with us this morning as we complete our study of Daniel. In thy name we pray. Amen. Well, last Sunday we came to an interesting break in Daniel's prophecy after describing historic events covering several hundred years that uh, followed Daniel's life. <clears throat> Daniel's prophetic writings say this, and I'm in Daniel chapter 11, verse 35 and 36. Some of the wise will fall victim and be martyred in order to be refined, pure, purified, and made clean until the end of time. Some descriptions say time of the end. For the appointed time is still to come. The king of the north will do as he desires. He will elevate himself and make the audacious claim that he is greater than all the other gods. He will say horrendous things about the one who is truly the one who truly is God of gods. gods. He will be successful in his exploits, but not forever. For the time of wrath will be fulfilled, and what is decreed must be accomplished. Uh, this passage in Daniel begins a transition from the time of history that he had prophesied to, <clears throat> to a time dealing with the 70th week of his prophecy. And just to remind ourselves what he prophesied, I'm going back to Daniel chapter 9, verse 22, and we'll read through 27. This is what Daniel said earlier. Gabriel says uh, to Daniel, Daniel, I have come for one purpose, to offer you insight and understanding into these matters. When you begin your pleading, pleading earlier today, a word was issued. I was instructed to come and tell you about it, for you are highly regarded by God. So place close attention so you can understand the vision. The decree has been issued. Your people and your holy city have seventy sevens of time to bring rebellion to a close, to put an end to sin, to wipe away guilt, to bring in a righteousness that endures, to seal up the prophet's vision, and to anoint the most sacred place. No one understand this from the proclamation of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the arrival of the anointed one. There will be seven weeks of time. For 62 weeks of time, the community will be restored, the city rebuilt, broad streets and deep defenses, even through times of trouble. After those 62 weeks of time, the anointed one will be cut down and have nothing. Then the warriors of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and defile the sanctuary. Its end will come swiftly, as in a flood, and to the end there will be war. The decree has been issued. Desolation. And that prince will make a binding treaty with many people for a one-week period of time. In the middle of that one period, he will put a stop to all sacrifices and offerings to the Lord, and at the height of his atrocities, he will set up an abominable idol that desecrates the most holy place until the desolation decreed is finally poured out on a defiler. So this 70th week is the uh, seven years of the Antichrist. It's called the Great Tribulation, a period of time in the future which, which has yet to be fulfilled. Now all the prophecy previous to that uh, in Daniel has been fulfilled. It covered the uh, two or three hundred years after, uh, after Daniel's death. So the passages we are about to read in the last uh, couple sections, the last chapter of Daniel, um, 
we read about will predict an invasion of Palestine and counterattacks from surrounding nations. Uh, the opposition armies, and those of the Antich and those of the Antichrist, will meet in the mountains of Israel. Uh, this event, we also, if you remember, read about in Ezekiel's chapter 38 and 39, where we had the man or person Gog from Magog, uh, who brings devastation to the region, uh, but then is slaughtered um, when God steps in. So let's go back to that uh, previous lesson. And it's Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 14, and we'll read uh, to 23, 38, 14. The eternal Lord told me, the Son of Man, to prophesy and tell Gog. God said, When you see my people Israel living safely, will you not take note? You and your vast army, recruited from many nations, all mounted on horses, will march one as one force down from the far north. Like a storm whose cloud covers the land, you will go up and attack my people Israel. In the last days, Gog, I will summon you to storm my land, then right in front of everyone's eyes, I will exhibit my holiness through you. This is what the Eternal Lord continued to say. Are you not the one I was talking about all those years through my servants, the prophets of Israel? For years they prophesied that I would summon you to march against them. On the day the prophecy is fulfilled, when God comes against the land of Israel, most certainly my wrath will come like a fire. My jealousy and burning anger guarantee that all of Israel will quake on that day. Creatures of the sky, earth and sea, all my people and beasts will shake with awe in my presence. The mountains will be knocked down, great cliffs and every fortress will crumble to the ground. I will summon the sword against Gog upon all of my hills and mountains. Confusion will abound. Gog's soldiers will turn and fight each other. I will come down and render my judgment in person. Disease and massacre will be their sentence. I will command heaven to throw everything it has upon Gog and all his armies, pouring down rain, hail, lightning, and burning sulfur. They will see just how great and holy I am. I will make myself known to all the nations of the world. Then they will know that I am the Eternal One. Uh, so chapter 12 now introduces the greatest event of history yet to be fulfilled, the second coming of Christ. You remember we talked about this in the end times. We have the rapture where Christ comes and uh, picks up all the believers. Well, this is the second coming of Christ at the end of tribulation. So in this last section, Daniel asks um, certain questions of the angel uh, messengers, and in return, he's allowed to understand that there are two great forces of work uh, in this world. All of us uh, kind of expect, expect that, the forces of good and evil. The evil of our age, and I'm speaking of our age today, is pretty subtle, and it's widespread. But the good of our age is also uh, better than it ever has been, I believe. Uh, so these are two contrasting forces in our society, but neither shall overcome the other. The good and evil are on a collision course to a final battle at the end of time. At the end time, God will directly intervene in human affairs. Uh, God is sovereign. He works his perfect plan through human beings. And neither the Nebuchadnezzars, Alexander the Great, Caesars, Herod, Stalin, Hitler, or Saddam Hussein of the world uh, can resist or stop God's plan for us. We are in the last days as described in Daniel's prophecy but we need not fear because uh, God is a living God. Our God is at work in the affairs of our world. And so even though we know that this age in which we are currently living ends in a disaster, we know that God will ultimately win. So at Daniel 36, the prophecy shifts from Antiochus Epiphanes, that uh, man from Syria uh, in the late uh, second century BC who uh, tries to eliminate the Jewish religion um, we now shift from him to the Antichrist the last world dictator uh, we've moved from about 160 BC to the end times to the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy 
Uh, both the Old and the New Testaments teach that a time of great tribulation will one day come to the earth. Uh, our interpretation of Daniel's 70th week, as we read earlier, locates this period in the last week of the 70-week prophecy. Uh, the event that triggers the beginning of that last seven years is the signing of a peace treaty, uh, a peace covenant with Israel, uh, by a powerful leader which we have called the Antichrist. Now, the purpose of the peace treaty ostensibly is seems to be protection for Israel so that the Jews could rebuild their temple in Jerusalem. Uh, the tribulation period will end when Christ returns and confines the Antichrist and Satan to the lake of fire, which we have read about in earlier lessons and which we'll read about again in the study of Revelation. So this evil ruler, which we call the Antichrist, doesn't really reveal himself and his true character right away. He begins his rise to power in a confederation of earthly nations. He is uh, the little horn that emerges from the ten horns, uh, which we've talked about before, and you should see a, uh, a vision a uh, rep representation of that beast coming up that, that Daniel saw earlier. Uh, let's go back to that chapter 7 uh, in Daniel. Um, if I can find it quickly. Chapter 7, verse 23. And it says, The heavenly being told me, the fourth beast, like the other three, represent a fourth kingdom that will rule on earth. This kingdom will be different from the rest. It will devour the whole earth and crush everything beneath its feet and shatter it all to pieces. The ten horns are ten kings. They will rise from this fourth kingdom. After these, another king will come to power, and, they will, and he will be very different from the kings before him, seizing power until he subdues the three other kings. So that was a description of the Antichrist. Um to make sure I read all that, yes. So he begins, the Antichrist begins as a man of peace who uh, seems to solve the world's problems and the Arab-Israeli problem. He's a master politician. Uh, and gradually, however, his evil designs are revealed. At the middle of the tribulation period, he will break the treaty, the covenant with Israel, and claim world control. He will be a spellbounding orator uh, with no religious uh, faith. His God is the God of military power and might. He will oppose all religions in general and oppose the Jews in particular, especially their hope that the Messiah will return and deliver them from their enemies. And so again, I'm in Daniel chapter 11. We'll finish off um, that. Verse 36, the king of the north will do as he desires. He will elevate himself and make the audacious claim that he is greater than all the gods. He will say horrendous things about the one who is truly God of the gods. He will be successful in his exploits, but not forever. For the time of wrath must be fulfilled, and what is decreed must be accomplished. He will have no respect for the gods worshipped by, by his ancestors or the one loved by women. That really implies uh, the Messiah. Women um, often hoped that they would be the mother of the Messiah or any other God that mattered. For he will make himself greater than all gods. Instead of these, he will honor only the God of fortresses, a God of his ancestors never knew, with gold and silver, with costly stones and other precious gifts. When he attacks the strongest fortresses, he will call upon these foreign gods for help. He will bestow great honor on those who are loyal to him, and for any who acknowledge him, he will grant power and authority over many people and divide up the land as their reward. So there are several other interpretations that uh, conclude that the individual that we've just discussed and named as the uh, Antichrist, some folks say that Daniel is continuing to describe Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, but in most of the commentaries I've read, in order to do that, you have to really twist and turn the analysis to point to Antiochus Epiphany. So 
my conclusion based upon my limited knowledge and what I've read is that Daniel in these chapters now is talking about the Antichrist. Um, in his opposition to the Jews, the Antichrist uh, uh, wasn't really against religion in general as um, as Antiochus Epiphanes wasn't really against religion in general, just the Jews, whereas the description here that uh, the Antichrist is opposed to all religions, and especially to Jews. Uh, as we read, the words at the time in Daniel's prophecy means the end times. It is the middle of the seven-year tribulation period, and the Antichrist's true nature, as I said, becomes more apparent. Uh, after breaking the peace covenant, he seizes the temple and he sets himself up as a god. Now this will usher in a uh, terrible time of suffering in the world, but especially for the Jewish people. He moves his army into Israel and sets himself up in the Jewish temple. Um, as we read and as we read in Ezekiel, the nations in the area will rise up arms to oppose him as we did that uh, previous reading. And this sets the stage for a fight called the Battle of Armageddon, which we probably heard of, which occurs at the end of the tribulation period. So I'm in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. Then at the end of the time, the king of the south will make war against the king of the north. So opposition rises up against the Antichrist. The king of the north will storm through the troops with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. Now, Daniel describes it in terms of uh, what he knew in those days. Um, and in warfare today, it certainly wouldn't be with um, horses uh, and chariots, but tanks and artillery. And so uh, Daniel's describing war as he knew it in those days and certainly would be different in the days today. Overwhelming the people and advancing to the south, the northern king, the Antichrist will enter the beautiful lands of promise, that of Israel, and take control of the many nations along the way. Yet other peoples will be rescued from his tyrannical hand, Edom and Moab and the best of Ammon. He will extend his reach over many other nations, and even the land of Egypt will not elude his wrath. He will seize control over the treasures of Egypt, all of its precious items, skillfully crafted gold and silver, the Libyans and the Ethiopians will follow in his steps and do his bidding, but various reports from the east and the north will eat away at the tyrant. Distressed and furious, he will send his forces to destroy and annihilate many nations. One day he will pitch his palatial royal tents between the great sea and the holy mountains of beauty, namely Mount Zion, Jerusalem. Then and there his end will come, and no one will stand with him. So Daniel opens chapter 12 by saying, at this time, which again means during the end times, as the huge army of the opposition uh, gets positioned to attack the Antichrist, the Son of Man, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, will appear in the heavens and his second coming. Paul says this about the Antichrist, who he calls the rebellious one or the man of lawlessness, depending upon your translations. We're going to pick a few verses here that refer back to this period of time that Daniel is prophesying. So for this, I'm in the book of Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians um, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And this is Paul. Since, brothers and sisters, we are on the topic of the coming of our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, and how we will all gather together to meet him, we ask that you don't let your minds get quickly rattled or become anxious because someone else's so-called spiritual revolution or because someone gave you a message or claimed to know of a letter allegedly from us reporting of the day of the Lord has already come. Don't be deceived by anyone. That day, that amazing day, won't come until after the great rebellion and the unveiling of the rebellious one. He's talking to uh, the great tribulation and the Antichrist. As the spawn of death, he delights in destruction. He sets himself up as the great adversary of God and vies for a place above all other so-called gods or objects of worship. If it were possible, he would even take a seat, yes, exalt himself in the temple of the one true God, declaring that he himself is God. So even Paul, 
prophesies that. And, and uh, if we go to the book of Matthew, we find that, that Christ uh, mentions this too. And we're in Matthew 24. I'll skip around a little bit, but we'll start at verse 15. Uh, as soon as I can find it. There you go. You will remember that the prophet Daniel predicted this, predicted the abomination that causes desolation. When you see the prophesied desolation of the holy place, reader, take notice that it's important that you understand this. That was in parentheses. When you see this, let those in Judea flee to the mountains. If you are relaxing on your rooftop one evening and the signs of the temple's destruction come, don't return to your house to rescue a book or a pet or a scrap of clothing. If you are in the field when the great destruction begins, don't return home for a cloak. Pregnant women and nursing mothers will have the worst of it. And as for you, pray that your flight to the hills will not come on the Sabbath or in the cold of the winter, for the tribulation will be unparalleled, hardships of a magnitude that has not been seen since creation, and that will not be seen again. I'm going to skip down to verse uh, 29. And as the prophets have foretold it, after the distress of these days, the sun will grow dark, the moon will be hidden, the stars will fall from the sky, and all the powers of the heavens will be dislodged and shaken from their places. That is when the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. All the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming. They will see him powerful and glorious, riding on chariots of clouds in the sky with a loud trumpet call. He will send out battalions of heavenly messengers, and they will gather his beloved faithful, elect from the four corners of creation, from one end of the heaven to the other. So Christ predicts this desolation caused by the Antichrist to be ended when uh, the Messiah comes back again, the Anointed One. And finally, another great reading in uh, Zechariah, a prophet, and the uh, minor prophet in the Old Testament, verse uh, chapter 14. Verses 1 through 3. Zechariah says, Pay attention. The day for eternal is coming, a night of judgment when your enemies will plunder your goods and divide them right in front of you. For I am going to incite all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city will be surrounded and taken. The houses will be ransacked. All of your treasured possessions will be looted. Your wives and daughters will be raped. Half of the city will be forced into exile. The other half will remain in the city to pick up the pieces. The Eternal One will join in the battle and fight against those enemy nations as your champion, as he would in any other day of battle. In chapter 9, or verse 9 says, And the Eternal will be crowned as king over all the earth. On that day, the Eternal One will be one, and his name will be one. So, predictions of the Antichrist, this final great battle between uh, good and evil, uh, has is is uh, prophesied and talked about throughout the uh, Old and the New Testament. Now Daniel is not as specific as Zechariah on who says um, the nation of Israel will see the Messiah as he comes from the heaven, recognize him and repent, trust him, and the nation will be cleansed. We know from Scripture these following things in Luke chapter one that God promised His Son a kingdom, that he will keep that promise. Uh, there will be a kingdom here on earth with Christ reigning with his people. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul says, when Jesus returns in the air, he will raise the dead in Christ, and then the living believers. That would take place during the rapture. And then when Jesus returns to, a, to earth to end the tribulation, he will bring the believers with him to shine in his glory and to share in his glory. And at that point, the Old Testament saints and the tribulation martyrs will be raised uh, to enter the kingdom. And finally, in Romans, Paul says, how we live and serve will determine the rewards that God will give us at the final judgment. And so in chapter 12 of Daniel, as soon as I find it, And we'll start the last chapter with these words. At that time, again, the end times, Michael, the great heavenly prince, the grand defender and guardian of your people will rise. Then the world will enter a time of distress unlike any in history. 
an hour of anguish greater than any nation has ever known. But during this time, your people, those whose names have been written in the scroll, will be liberated. And the many who will sleep, the sleep of death and the dust of the earth, will awake, some to eternal life with the Lord, and others to utter shame and eternal disgrace far from him. Those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky at midday, and those who make the many righteous will shine as the stars forever and ever. Um, Daniel, during his long life, prayed faithfully, uh, studied the scriptures, sought to serve God and the Lord, and, and always uh, took the Lord's word which guided him uh, and protected him and used him for God's glory. Now we are able to study prophecy today because Daniel was faithful in his day. And in the ancient world, transactions were ratified with two documents. Uh, one of the documents was sealed and kept in a safe place, and a second document then was made available for general distribution. So God looked on Daniel's book as a deed that he would faithfully keep his promises. Uh, the book was sealed, and we'll read those words in a minute, in a sense that the full meaning of what Daniel wrote would not be understood right away, but until the end times. The book was to be treasured, protected, and shared with the Jewish people. Uh, Daniel 12.4 As for you, Daniel, keep these visions and their meaning a secret. Write down what you have seen and heard, and then seal the scroll until the time of the end. Many will wander here and there, and knowledge will expand. Well, two more angels arrive on the uh, banks of the Tigris River. That's where the vision started in this last couple chapters. Uh, the man in linen, which we read about earlier uh, from chapter 10, is probably Jesus. Uh, when asked how long this period of trials will be, Jesus says, for a time, times, and a half, meaning a year, two years, and a half year, which has been interpreted to mean 42 months or 1260 days or three and a half years. Uh, once the treaty is signed between the Antichrist and Israel, the clock starts ticking off seven years. When the Antichrist sets himself up uh, as a god in the temple in Jerusalem, uh, the last half of Daniel's 70th week begins. The tribulation period punishes the Gentile nations for the way they have sinned against the Jews. And it is also a time for uh, sifting and purifying Israel from all their sins and preparing the Jews for the coming Messiah. And so I'm in again, chapter 12, verse 5. Then I, Daniel, stood on the bank of the Tigris River and looked up as two others appeared, one on my side of the river and the other on the far side. One of them spoke to the man dressed in linen who was upstream. This heavenly being, Jesus says, How long will it be until these disturbing events come to an end? I watched and listened carefully. The man dressed in linen who was upstream raised both his hands into the sky toward heaven. He swore an oath by him who lives eternally that these disturbing events would last for a time, times, and a half a time, and that when the shattering of the power of God's holy people comes to an end, then all this would be over. Well, like all of us, Daniel asked God how long and uh, when will it end, or how will it end, uh, when we face times of difficulty or uh, the future is in doubt. God knew how much Daniel, and us, us as well, actually, needed to know and how much he could take. In other words, God doesn't feed us everything because we are unable to absorb it all. Uh, but he does promise it will be clear for those living in the end times. He also reveals that as trials come to people on earth during the end times, believers will become purer and wiser, but the wicked will become more wicked and more vocal. Uh, believers will have their eyes open to the truths in much the same way that um, Christ told his disciples when they asked him, uh, why do you teach in parables? And Christ said words simply that meant 
while those who believe will understand the parables and those who not will not. And so the same thing will happen during this tribulation period, that believers will have their eyes open to the truth. The significance of the 1290 days that we're about to read and the 1335 days uh, in the light of uh, the few verses is really unclear. And maybe that's one of the things that is yet to be revealed. Uh, though the Lord had taught Daniel many things and revealed to him many mysteries, it was not for him to know everything before he died. And so let's finish off the book of Daniel with these last words. I heard what he said, but I could not understand its meaning. Daniel says, My Lord, how will all of this come out in the end? The man in linen, who is Jesus, says, it is time for you to go on your way, Daniel, for the words must be kept secret and sealed until the time of the end. Many will keep themselves pure and clean and refined despite the pressures of those times, but those who are wicked will continue their wicked ways and none of them will ever understand, but those who are wise will. From the time when the daily sacrifice is prohibited and the disgusting idol that desecrates the most holy place, that would be the temple, is put in its place, there will be 1290 days. Those who remain true to God and reach out, reach the end of the 1335 days are sure to experience God's blessing. As for you, Daniel, go and be faithful to the end of your life. You will surely rest. But when the day of days arise, you will rise again to receive the inheritance allotted for you. And that promise is not only for Daniel, but for us as well. So let's see if we can summarize what we've done over the past uh, several couple months, anyhow. Uh, when the Apostle John completed the book of Revelation, he was told to keep the book unsealed because the time was at hand. Uh, we need the book of Daniel to understand the book of Revelation. At least 71 passages from Daniel are quoted or alluded to uh, in 16 New Testament books, most of them in the book of Revelation. Now, Daniel was a man of God, and we can learn a lot uh, from him. Um, he believed in a sovereign God. He believed that God rules all things through wisdom and power. He had a very disciplined prayer life. Uh, he prayed daily, and he just didn't pray when he needed help or he turned to God when he was in trouble. Um, he studied the scripture, and he believed it. He did it, he did the study to a certain what God's will and then to uh, obey it. He had, an, uh, he had an understanding of spiritual warfare, which today I think we probably uh, kind of boohoo. Um, God has, um, was given, has given us the ability to uh, battle evil. And so there's always a, a battle of good and evil going on in the world. Uh, Daniel uh, sought only to glorify God. He used his great talents to honor God and to serve others, which is something that we should emulate. And he realized he had work to do. God gave him his high position in the government so he could serve God and others. And oftentimes in our careers, whether they're lowly positions or high positions, we oftentimes perhaps forget that God has a purpose of us being in that position and to uh, serve our time there as uh, God would want us to. I hope you've enjoyed this, uh, this lesson. I certainly have enjoyed teaching it. It is a great prelude to what comes next, the book of Revelations. Uh, Daniel is a man that we could all emulate. His um, uh, ability to uh, adjust to the worlds around him allowed him to be in high positions of government for uh, four different kingdoms. Uh, he uh, lived to be 84 years old, about uh, a, tr a tremendous man that we could all look up to and learn from. I hope you've uh, enjoyed these lessons, you got something out of them, and I uh, look forward to seeing you uh, next week in person. Let's bow our heads. Our Father God, thank you for uh, bringing us your word, help us and helping us to understand its meaning for us in our lives today and uh, hope for the future just as Daniel wished his people would find hope in the words that he left us. Uh, 
be with us as we go about this week and bring us back again safely next Sunday. In thy name we pray. Amen. Have a terrific week. See you in a week.